The information discussed on Pocket Money with Jeff Tarbell is believed to be from reliable sources. However, no responsibility is assumed for inaccuracies. No statement made on this broadcast should be construed as a specific recommendation of a particular investment product. Views expressed are those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent those of CBS Radio. News only is directed. Smiles, everyone. Smiles. And prepare yourself for... Show me the money! Ladies and gentlemen, the radio broadcast experience designed to keep your wallet in top condition. It's Talking Money with Jeff Tarbell. Talking Money. Talking Money. Entering the studio, your guru for fiscal fitness, Jeff Tarbell. Right, right. I thought it was you, it was me. I had the on button off. Hey, I've been to Dick's last, that last resort right there, uh, right there in San Diego, Old Town. Yeah, yeah. We're off to. I, mean, you, I just don't think you can have ridiculousness on the, stu, on the no. in the studio and try to do a show at the same time. So we'll uh, we'll work around. How you doing? We're doing good. You rode your bike in today. That's right. Nice morning. It was cool this morning. A little bit coming in. Were you cold? No, no. <laughs> I was. Because I was wearing <laughs> Maybe shorts. You had shorts and a t-shirt. On. <laughs> yeah, I shorts and a t-shirt. And I was hitchhiking, so it was cool. <laughs> we start every uh, every Saturday the same way. Treme- tremendous political, financial, and emotional risk. The guy who has one shirt or ten shirts with the same name on it, either way. Chris Law, what's happening in your world? Uh, not much. Okay. Uh, one of the big things was uh, Buffett's uh, billion dollar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, billion dollar pledge. Hey, if you get it right, you'll get a billion dollars. Never, ever going to happen, ever. You got a chance, better chance of winning ten lotteries. Now, hey, let me ask you a question <laughs> first. Did you did, did they set the teams first and you had to pick or you had to do the original set also? Do you know? Do you know? Well, Oh, you mean like the four playing games? Yeah. So I, I thought you had to p- pick even the people that were in actually in the going to be in the tournament. All sixty, the original sixty four, or or did they let you set the teams first, then you could pick down from there? No, whatever the tournament is. Okay. So, so whatever. The- I, I, it's not even waste worth like the forty <laughs> seconds to fill it in. To <laughs> I begin know. With. I know. So <laughs> everyone's just like, oh, everyone's talking about it. So I guess it is really smart because everyone's talking about it. But there's no. Ch- I think the closest anyone's ever gotten is the first two rounds perfect. And that's happened once. Yeah. In the whatever years of 64 games ever. That's what's happened. Then it's a perfect promotion, then, isn't it? Because you don't have to pay out and you get all kinds of. And, and I will to... give someone $10 billion if they fill out a perfect uh, one next year. Now, I did Did you see, they, they, did, they did an interview with Warren Buffett. He said, uh, and they asked him, what happens if someone gets down like to the Sweet 16 and, and, they're, and they're still going good? He says, I'm going to make them an offer they cannot refuse. No. No, there's no chance. Even if you get to the 16, no way it happens. I, it's, why not? Hey, it, it can all. It can. So, hey, if you can walk out in your backyard and find like 10 million dollars in gold coins and a little can under a, under a flipping tree, anything can happen. No, this is impossible. That's even more. I'm going out on that. That's even, this is impossible. Okay, even more impossible than that. I got you. Even more impossible than than California or Sacramento getting a new arena. That impossible. And that's even possible. We've got uh, all kinds of things going on today. Our number's here in the studio. If you want to join us, 339-1140, 1-800-920-1140, or you can text myself or John, 441140. We do have in the second half of our show today, Chris, just to let you know, we've got uh, an author going to give us a call. Uh, James Lacey is a uh, the author of Taxifornia, uh, How Liberals Are Bankrupting California. And he'll come in and talk about some of the issues that uh, California is dealing with, with uh, taxes and other issues, a new book that just came out. So we'll have James join us. The second half of the show today, if you want to tune in for that, you can uh, hang around. We'll get to him. John's been uh, making notes in his book there. First time you've opened a book in a long time, isn't it? It is. It is. <laughs> That's actually called a book. You don't see a lot of those anymore. They're on there. Not should, sure what to do with this. It's got pages, and you can get ink on your hand if you're not careful. <laughs> so, um, interesting week this week. Let's see. What, when was the last time one country took over another one? It's been a while. And not a shot was fired. Pretty interesting week. I think it it, just, it almost just kind of went by. It's like it just. Yeah. It's like okay, on Friday we, uh, you know, we're, Russia signed a uh, signed a, uh, I don't know what they signed in their own, I guess their own laws says we'll, we'll take over Crimea and that was it. We didn't do a damn thing about it. 
I'm not saying we should, but nobody did anything about it. Yeah, it really wasn't publicized that much. No, it just it kind of happened, and uh, there you have it. We now have a a new little uh, beachfront community as part of our country, and um, the United States and and a few others said we're going to put some sanctions on you, which may have some effect, probably not, but may have some effect. I don't know if you caught um, if you follow this show on on Facebook. I posted a link this week, uh, and you can find it, again, it's the Talk of Money page on Facebook. I posted a link from Forbes magazine, and it was five things you should know about um, uh, Putin's incursion into Crimea. And, and if, you're, if you're not a big political follower or geopolitical follower, and I would say that I am not, it's, it, I like it because it's like just five bits. Of, you only have to read five things. And it does give you some pretty good insight into what's going on. And, and the one of them... Obviously, one of them is just Crimea's location. It gives them a port into you know in, in, into the water, which is they have a naval base and they want to keep that, which I get. This is the one that you probably didn't know. I didn't know. Um, Crimea looms, looms large in Russia's history. Um, back in the 1850s, they lost a huge battle there, but but Russians consider Crimea much like Americans consider the Alamo. You know, it's kind of a, a source of pride in terms of a big big battle went, went on there, and uh, the Alamo in Texas, and so they they consider it to be you know very similar in their hearts that, that, that we do with the Alamo, or Texans do. So I, I didn't know that. That was kind of interesting. Um, uh, this is the, And this is the other part that I think that is interesting. In 1994, Ukraine agreed to give up its nuclear weapons, and Russia vowed to respect Ukraine as a nation and basically said you guys can be autonomous and independent. So Ukraine, who had, was either developing or had nuclear weapons, gave them up as part of the agreement. And then that, that agreement just got washed out the out the door. So um, this article would lead you to believe that that Putin is, um, is is a little bit desperate for something, and I'm not sure what. Um, but it does bring up the fact that uh, NATO is now going to consider membership for Georgia, which is the n- neighboring former Russian state of now a country of Georgia, is now going to be brought into NATO probably quicker, and will be geared up with advanced weapon systems and. So uh, Russia just invited a new neighbor, that is, and and now they've just of course burned their friendship with Ukraine, whatever I, they had. So it's, inter- it's interesting. Did you, did you did you see this week, even locally? We have a, there's a huge huge Russian population in our area in this listing area and Ukrainian, both of them. And I thought it was very interesting this week that the sheriff came out, had a little meeting together with them, and said, "Hey, we, let's just discuss our differences, but let's keep it on a discussion level." So it's even though you're not living there anymore, it sure, certainly carries over and. And why not? I mean, if, if all your family and your homeland mm-hmm. is back there, either side of it. Um, very interesting to see what happens. Russia uh, has now banned nine U.S. government officials from coming over there. I think um, John, I don't know if John Kerry is one of them. I know that, uh, I, I have to find the list of who was banned. They, they, can't go to, they can't go to Russia anymore, at least temporarily. And the Russian stock market took a fairly good hit this week as um, they become a little bit more isolated. So they do not have a, Real, real strong economy over there. In fact, they mentioned in the article that if 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 oil prices were to dip, say fifteen to twenty percent, it would come very close to causing a very, very deep collapse of their Russian economy because they're selling so much oil. So I don't know why oil would go down. Usually, when things get, get all crazy, oil goes up, right? And stocks go down, and bonds go up, and, and yet this is a week that I, I would I think we might even mention last Saturday. I think I said. Something, something strange is going to happen this week. We don't know what it was going to be. And I would have thought the minute you heard that, that Russia took over Ukra- uh, Crimea, that bonds would have gone way up, rates would have gone down. Yeah, right, better. Yeah, and the stock market would have gone sideways. Nothing didn't happened. quite happen like that. No, <laughs> stocks did fairly well, and bonds didn't do anything, and, and it barely made the news. We can't find an airplane with 239 people on it, and we're wall-to-wall coverage on that, and the whole country just got absorbed by another one, and we can barely catch catch a word on that that's interesting what we find interesting anywho that's the uh, wrap up on that story and that'll be a continual we'll see obviously it doesn't have any uh, as long as there are not people lobbing uh, bombs and grenades and, and and guns across back and forth i guess our local stock market doesn't care and if that doesn't happen then we probably won't care the russian stock market might help a little bit i do have some interesting uh, some interesting financial tidbits that i, I thought were unusual i did see I think this is the I think this is the first reported Bitcoin real estate purchase to occur. 
Was it the house in Vegas? No, it was not the house in Vegas, although we've seen a, a number of them advertised. This one was, um, let's see here, one Bitcoin enthusiast. Are you an enthusiast? If you own, if, I guess if someone gave me Bitcoins, I'd be enthused. I've handed over more. <laughs> or than, confused. Yeah, I wouldn't know where they are, but I'd be happy to. But anyway, this uh, enthusiast handed over more than 800 Bitcoins to buy a two-bedroom luxury villa in Bali, Indonesia. Sales took place on uh, February 19th. And um, so they, they figured this the sale was more than about, about a half a million dollar price. Now, Bitcoins are running at about $600 a piece right now if someone hasn't stolen them or you can find them. So eight times six is 48. So yeah, but it's a pretty, yeah. pretty close to, pretty close to um, 480,000. So right in the, in the market there. They didn't say who the buyer was. The seller said he will um, cash in some and save others for the value to go up. So there you go, your first virtual Bitcoin sale. 800 Bitcoins will get you a two-bedroom luxury villa in Bali, Indonesia. That sounds high. I still think that half a million dollars sounds high for a two-bedroom in Bali, yeah. Indonesia. That you're going to go to a couple times a year? Well, I don't know. Maybe he's going to rent it out. Maybe yeah. gonna, it's got a little pool outside the room. It can't be too bad. Here, I'll, I'll show you what you can get for 800 Bitcoins. And I did see this week that someone... So this is... Uh, have you ever lost your wallet? <laughs> Speaking of someone who recently <laughs> has, they just found... Um, Hundred and was it one hundred and fourteen million dollars in bitcoins in a virtual wallet that was misplaced? I don't know how you misplace your virtual wallet, but if anybody finds my virtual wallet, let me know. Please return it. I will share the hundred and ten million dollars with you. But someone in that whole mess a couple weeks ago, I guess, discovered where the some of the money was, or they were about ready to hang them outside of a tr outside of a building, and they f came up with the money. I don't know which, but I I'm still not on the Bitcoin train. I'm sorry. I was at a, a first St. Patrick's Day over at a local place, and they were selling tickets outside the door. And I walk in, I go, well, well I guess these are valuable. The guy next to me goes, probably more valuable than a Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> at least you can find it. If you can trade it for two beers. That's right. You can get a Guinness and a... <laughs> yeah, then you, you got, you, you're, on, you're on the right path. This one, um, this, this I don't get. Another, of the many things I don't get in life, which is usually most of, of everything, uh, have, you heard of, have you heard of Airbnb? No. Chris, you heard of Airbnb? Nobody? Like Air Bed and Breakfast? That's exactly what it is. Air Bed and Breakfast. That was the original. Airbedandbreakfast.com was the original website name. Now it's called Airbnb. Does that ring a bell to you now? No. No. Well, they're about ready to they're about ready to go public, and they think they'll be valued at $10 billion. And the four, three of us, I'm going to guess four of us, have never used or heard Airbnb before. Even at Dick's Last Resorts, they don't know Airbnb. Nope. See? Airbnb. I know that. I know some of our listeners are going, "Hey, you guys are idiots." Every, everybody knows what. <laughs> we Airbnb. know that already. <laughs> <laughs> that would be stating the obvious. Don't waste your time with that. Airbnb is the website where you can go online and rent bedrooms or home sharing from other individuals. That's starting to ring a bell now. No. Um, so if you are a homeowner, so let's say you had a house in downtown San Francisco, three bedroom house. You want to rent out one or two bedrooms or the whole thing? You can list your house. By the way, there's 600,000 listings on this website. You can list your house on Airbnb, and um, you can rent out your room or rooms or house or whatever you want to do. Kind of like a, you've heard of VRBO, vaca Vacation Rental by Owner. Chris, you need to get out of the studio a little bit. I don't have any money. Uh, I don't, it doesn't matter if you have any money or not, but you can still. Uh, so VRBO is very, very popular uh, with a lot of people who will look for uh, rent, rental houses, you know, but anyway, Airbnb, have you heard of Uber? Yes. Okay. So, so think of, think of, uh, so Uber is a car sharing. Think of Airbnb as the house sharing, si similar concept. And they're both mentioned in this article. So a company, this is what gets me. Airbnb owns nothing. They don't own a hotel. They don't own the houses you're in. They don't own squat. They own a, they own a website and a, and a concept. They had um, $250 million in revenue last year. That's a decent year by any standards. And they're about ready to be valued. So they did, they did raise some, some, public, some private money, and they were valued last year about $2.5 billion, just based on what kind of the value of the um, private money that was invested in them. So if you're, making 200, if you're grossing $250, a year, $250 million a year, $2.5 billion is about 10 times revenue. That what I would see... Okay, you know that, that that is respectable. They're expected to come out at about ten billion dollars when they come public. Let me tell you who else is worth ten billion dollars or less in their field. You ever heard of Hyatt? Yes. Hyatt Hotels. 
they actually own something. They own some of their hotels. They also manage hotels that are owned by other people. They're valued less than this. Intercontinental Hotels at $8 billion. Starwood and Marriott are slightly bigger at 15 and they own something. And they also manage other ones. Hilton is the largest at $21 billion. So, um, yeah, here you go. Wyndham, Wyndham Worldwide manages 7,500 hotels, Ramada and other brands, and is, will be valued less than Airbnb that owns nothing. This is where I start to wonder if we're coming back to a bubble again. Uber, the car rental. Oh, by the way, Airbnb is not exactly um, having it entirely as, as easy. They're being investigated by um, attorney, New York Attorney General over there. They want their list of hosts. They want to see if the people that own the houses are violating New York law. And they do have a problem with, they have had issues with guests behaving less than perfectly in their homes and theft and vandalism. And uh, Airbnb will put up a million-dollar insurance policy for their hosts. Last month, they had a complaint that there was a um, Manhattan apartment was turned into the site of a sex party, <laughs> which led to tens of thousands of dollars in property damage, and Airbnb had to come in and fix the house back up. Now, I don't know if they got a portion of the revenue of the video or not, but anyway, that's what happens. But Uber, have you guys have you used Uber? Yeah. Yeah, you have used Uber? And I have not, but I have heard it uh, that is pretty cool. Now, Uber, if, once you sign up with them, your credit card's on file. You don't have to pay any cash when the car shows up. You don't tip them nothing. They tell you where the car is on the map. And so Uber is, again, again using privately on somebody else's vehicles to come get you. And as you can imagine, the hotel owners and the cab owners, not so thrilled. Not so thrilled. With Airbnb and Uber, to say the least, um, because they don't have to necessarily follow the same rule. And, and this will be, be another problem where the, the taxes are. The taxes yeah. on hotels are huge and cabs and things, too. So they're losing tax revenue. So that's going to come to a, uh, a head. Uber is about ready to go. Um, I guess they're looking at going public. Also, was valued last year at three point eight billion dollars. Again, we don't even own a we don't own a car. We have a website and a and a cool app and a good idea, but we don't own a vehicle. Three point eight billion dollars for. And what's going to start us from start? What we could start again? We, we could start Goober. And we could do our own cars. In fact, we probably should start Goober. <laughs> That's right. And we'll just do we'll do a car for half. And what, I mean, what's going to prevent us from coming in? You don't have any. I mean, and creating our yeah, own app. Maybe we're only worth one point six billion. Yeah, <laughs> just, how about just the point eight. <laughs> That's right. It's just the point eight. We probably wouldn't get up on a Saturday as, as many times. So, uh, if you have any thoughts on Goober, Uber, or Airbnb, we'll take them. Three three nine eleven forty. One eight hundred nine two zero eleven forty. We're going to take our first break of the morning here. Johnny's got a quiz question for us, and uh, we have some Sacramento Rivercats tickets. Rivercats baseball starting up here real soon, probably first to next month. And uh, but just a quick note, John and I will be next Saturday live with you up at um, Sierra at Tahoe. Sierra at Tahoe Ski Resort to kind of uh, wind up the season with them. They'll be open for a few more weeks after. Are they said till Easter? Uh, just till after Easter, right? After Easter, so a few more, a few more weeks up there. We'll and give you. More snow coming end of this week. Yeah, I saw that. So it probably will snow like crazy of Saturday morning <laughs> as we're heading up there. I can almost guarantee it. Um, right. So we'll be checking that out. Anyway, we've got a quiz question for you. If you want some Rivercast tickets or some roundtable uh, pizza, artisan flatbread pizza, we can do that too. Your choice, 339-1140, or you can text us at 441140. Yeah, we're going to make you guys think a little bit. So wake I'm, up. I'm out. You're out. Raphael Perker. Who? Raphael Perker, okay. P-I-R-K-E-R, won uh, in the federal courts against essentially FAA. Okay. And it is definitely going to be uh, a very prevalent law that's going to affect a lot of different things, a okay. lot of money, a lot of jobs in the future. So this, the, F the FAA sued this guy and he won right. in court. That's right. He's a 29-year-old Australian entrepreneur living here, actually living in Asia. Okay. And uh, he won against the federal courts. What, federal what court? did he win? What was the suit about? What was the suit about? Hmm. FAA suit against this guy. Yeah, it ties into another story we talked about in the past, right. too. So it actually talks into a couple stories we talked about in the past. Three, three, yeah, nine, pretty cool looking, too. Yeah, I'm not sure that's a... That may be the artist rendering. I'm not sure that's a, a real picture. Three, three, nine, eleven, forty. 1-800-920-1140. You can text us at 441140. Big uh, case this week. The FAA sued a gentleman in the court, and he won. What was the FAA suing him about? Good question. 
Maybe he's got the jet. Somebody's got the jet. Somewhere. I don't know. I might be wrong on that whole story, too. It might be in the water now. Who knows? This is Talking Money. We're going to be right back, Jack. Talking Money. Well, all righty then. We're back to Talking Money with Jeff Tarbell. Right, right. How you doing? We are back, Jack. Let's see here. Well, did we get a winner there, Chris? You got one, yeah? So what did this guy do? Somebody's paying attention. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, let's see. Jeff Bezos at Amazon hasn't done it, nor has Fred Smith at FedEx or Scott Davis at UPS. No American CEO has persuaded Washington to relax its chokehold on commercial drone use in the United States. Oh, yeah. But this 29-year-old has uh, beat the feds, shot him down. He was the one that was uh, taking videos of different, um, like, Statue of Liberty. Yeah, architectural uh, things. And he would sell sell the videos. And, yeah, okay. Right. Did a very nice job with him. He got like yeah. a pretty pretty decent fine from the FAA, like 10, 10 or 20 grand or something. $10,000. Like um, basically, he's flying a, what, five pound, small, ice chest. tiny little, <laughs> little styrofoam, ice chest. styrofoam thing. And he was apparently flying too close to buildings, too close to cars in a tunnel, and too close to people. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you that, that within the, within the, um, general aviation world which is where i am a little bit now because i'm learning to fly the the drone usage is a little bit scary only because that you know some of these as john's talking about a, a little lightweight five pound styrofoam thing but some of these drones have you seen some of these things they are huge and they're flying around at a pretty good clip and uh, if one of those were to hit a plane a little cessna like i'm flying we both could come down and so that's that's what the fa is worried about right is that you've got somebody flying a piece of equipment that is not uh, looking out, looking in all directions, you know, basically following the rules of, of, of uh, VFR flight. And um, and that could be a mess. So that's what they're worried about. And a lot of pilots are worried about it, too. you got people buzzing around, things that, that you know, aren't following airspace rules and other, th- other things, too. So it, it's a pro- it, it could be a problem. But they're going to have to figure out a way to address it. I mean, so... Well, one of the highlights here, if I can pull it up real quick, uh, trade groups say that some 100,000 U.S. jobs and $80 billion in business over the next decade are online uh, with different drone use. Yeah. Well, they'll have to create an airspace for it and and just create some rules. And I mean, they're all all over the place already. You can go out to RC. Yeah, realtors are using them for filming and everything. Yeah, you can buy them anywhere. I, I, I forgot to mention, as we were talking about the Airbnb, this is a pretty cool story about how the guys got started. And uh, so back in 2008, these two guys, Brian and Joe, moved to the Bay Area, and they were hurting for money. So when a big conference would come in town, they would rent out air mattresses in their apartment to just try to raise money so people had a place to stay. So they, they, that was their idea. But it didn't. Airbed and Breakfast didn't take off. So what they started doing instead was they started designing and selling cereal boxes of then-presidential candidates Barack Obama and John McCain. And they made tens of thousands of dollars selling designed cereal boxes with pre- presidential candidates. And uh, this guy, Paul Graham, who was the founder of a kind of an incubator down there in the Bay Area, found him and said, that's a good idea, and then took off with their, their other idea. So they didn't huh. uh, they didn't just walk out, create a website, and make billions of dollars. They, they put Slept a mat- on an air mattress put for a, a while mat- first. Put a mattress on the ground, had cereal, and then made $10 billion, like we all do. So <laughs> um, interesting uh, little story there as well. We do have uh, a guest going to join us here in a few minutes. Maybe, uh, yeah, there's Jim right there calling in now. Uh, James Lacey is the, ox- the author of Taxifornia. Um, how liberals are bankrupts in California. I think we've got uh, Jim there now. Hey, Jim, how you doing? Very good. How are you doing, Jeff? Good. Welcome. Uh, thanks for calling in on a Saturday morning. How's things down south there? Uh, they're doing great. I happen to be in Santa Barbara today. Ah, beautiful. Yeah, it's absolutely nice. Attended an event uh, of high school students at the Reagan Ranch Center here, and it's just great to see that there's still people, even young people, that care about the future of California. This is what this is all about. So are you are you actually at, at the Reagan Library? Is that where that where you were? At the Reagan Ranch Center. Oh, Reagan, okay. Santa Barbara, which is associated with Reagan's Ranch up on uh, Rancho del Cielo. Okay, yeah, and I and I, I t- actually took my daughters to the Presidential Library for for Reagan, which you know, I thought they would be bored stiff, and they actually loved it. It's so it's fabulous, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is a it is a phenomenal location. But uh, that's not why we're here this morning. We've been uh, pr- promoting you for a couple of weeks, and I apologize. We had you scheduled a couple of weeks ago, and we've had to bounce around a little bit. But you've got a new book out, uh, Taxifornia, 
uh, Liberals Laboratory to Bankrupting America. And, um, you know, rather than us trying to read and interpret, why don't you give us a little background on what you got you into the book and what is your background and, and what are you hoping to, to gain? Well, uh, I'm an attorney and I worked in the Reagan administration for all eight years. I served as general counsel of the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission. And I have a background in politics in California. Right out of law school, I helped Howard Jarvis uh, as a young aide to pass the Proposition 13 tax cut initiative. I've been born and raised in California, and other than my time in Washington working for Reagan, uh, you know, have lived here and gone to school here. And I got inspired to write the book, frankly, after the election in 2012, when Democrats completed their total grip on California politics. Liberal Democrats took control of every single constitutional office in the state of California, two-thirds majorities in the legislature, the state senate, and the assembly, and they passed Proposition 30, which raised taxes in California to the highest level of any state in the nation. We ended up having and now have the highest state income tax, the highest state sales tax, and the highest gas tax at the pump, which was something that they added in 2013. And I felt that with the economy being in the near shambles that it is, that there was no longer any excuse that could be made about whose policies were responsible for these economic problems. With the de liberal Democrats so firmly in control and put in there by their public employee union allies, I felt that in writing Tax California, I wanted to detail exactly how our state has gotten to the economic ruin that it is today, and it's because of liberal Democrats and their total grip on power, and I'll make one connection here to connect the dots. These liberal Democrats have imposed these taxes and they've imposed these regulations, and what is the result? California has led the nation in so many ways, Jeff, but what it leads the nation in right now is poverty. California, for the second year in a row, according to Obama's Census Bureau, is the poorest state in the nation. One in four Californians live in abject poverty, live in defined poverty levels. One in four. Over 6.1 million Californians are living in poverty. And one of the reasons they're living in poverty is these liberal Democrats have imposed these highest consumption taxes on sales, on cell phones, on alcohol, on tobacco, on um, utilities, on gasoline, highest gas tax at the pump. And this has pushed the cost of living so high for tens of thousands of Californians that these policies have made them poor. And we haven't even got into discussing the unemployment rate yet. So, look, what, what is your thought on on Governor Brown? Because I, I I thought, and I guess hoped that um, when he came in, that maybe you know, after having gone a few rounds and and a little older, a little wiser, that that maybe he would clamp down a little bit on some of his own party. And, and has he done that at all? Has he been beneficial, or, or or has he in your in your mind added to to the to the issue? Well, I don't think all the problems in the state can be blamed on Brown, and Brown does have experience and probably has in some minor ways uh, held back these two-thirds majorities in the state Senate and the Assembly from doing even more wacky things. But the reality is is that you know Brown is a part of the problem, not the solution. The California Teachers Association has spent $300 million dollars on politics in this state since the year 2000. And with the SEIU and the correctional officers, those public employee unions have spent a half a billion dollars on politics to elect people like Brown to do their bidding. When Brown did his last budget, uh, there, were, there were a total of four people in the room. Brown, the leader, Democrat leader of the state Senate, the Democrat leader of the state assembly, and the political operative from the California Teachers Association. Public employee unions have bought and paid for uh, this government, and they put $5 million into Brown's election campaign four years ago, and they're going to put plenty in it to this time. There's not enough pushback from the Democrats on these public employee unions because the reason that the taxes are high, among other things, is because of the out-of-balance defined benefit plans or pensions that these public employee unions have, and they're underfunding. And it is working its way entirely through government, and Brown isn't pushing back far enough. 
he went in and pushed this Proposition 30 tax increase, and they claim that they have a surplus. Dan Walters said that the tax, you know, that Brown promised us, just as Obama promised us, that we were going to be able to keep our plan and keep our doctor. Brown promised us uh, two years ago that the Proposition 30 tax increase was for the kids, that they were going to help the kids. But even Dan Walters, a neutral observer and columnist for the Sacramento Bee, has written that the Proposition 30 money isn't being spent for the kids. It's being spent on more welfare, prisons, and to hype public employee union salaries. It's shuck and jive, and it's basically lies to the people because if they told the people they were going to use the taxes to raise public employee union salaries, the proposition wouldn't pass. So Brown, in a big sense, is a part of the problem in California. I don't think he's the biggest part of the problem. I think the bigger part of the problem is that the CTA's total lock on power and the fact that people aren't connecting, that they're a special interest, just like big tobacco, just like big oil. And in fact, they're way bigger than big tobacco or big oil. The $300 million that the CTA spent on politics in the year 2000 is compared against $90 million by Chevron. Now, would you think that Chevron Oil Company would have a lot of interest in California? They sure do. CTA spent more than the Indian tribes. They spent more than the California Chamber of Commerce. They spent more than the pharmaceutical industry. They spend more than AT&T on politics. They are a special interest, and their interests are not in favor of the state, you and me, the kids, the future. What they're in favor of is high public salaries and high defined benefit plans, and they're not helping to make the concessions that need to be made. And in the meantime... I don't mean to go on and on, but in the meantime, cities like San Jose are putting up now 30 to 35 percent of their budget to pay for pension obligations. Roads are going unpaved. San Jose had to shut down its burglary unit. Vacaville, which has already gone down, is going into its second bankruptcy, has cut its fire stations from nine to six. San Bernardino's in bankruptcy. Stockton's in bankruptcy. There's 3,000 miles of unpaved roads that need to be paved in Solano and Sonoma County and San Joaquin County because public employee pensions have created such terrible obligations. Do you know, Jeff, they just announced in San Francisco that, that in 2013 a line firefighter made $346,000 that year. Where I live in in Orange County, the average pay in 2012 for a firefighter was 235000 Now, when they can retire after 25 to 30 years of work at 90% of pay and for a defined benefit plan, you can see where this is going. Government is – and the reason I wrote Taxifornia, which is available on Amazon.com, the reason that I wrote it is, is, is greatly because of the shifting of government that's going on in California. Local governments are, are within five to ten years, are going to be spending as much as 50% or more of their general funds for retirement benefits for past employees. That doesn't get the young people anything. It doesn't get them new police services. It doesn't give them fire services. It doesn't give them new roads. What it basically does is have them paying taxes to a system that's just taking care of elderly people that used to work for the government. We are in a dire state now, and my book discusses this, and that's why I wrote Tax Affordance. Yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking at uh, – I carried a printout with me. Uh, fire captain, Sacramento Metro Fire District, $349,000 wages, 66 in benefits. That's almost four hundred grand. So you start looking at uh, – it's one thing to pay them while they're employed, but you're paying them for life. And that. So what's the uh, – is, is there a solution or resolution in your book to how we make the turn, or does – California make the turn, and we were we were looking at one of the comments you made that that um, you know Republicans generally. There's, I mean, can you can you even run for office as a Republican in California, and and do do the money earners and the money generators do they stay here, or do they just all pick up and go next door? I mean, what what is what is the solution in your mind? Well, the, I'm not certain that there is a solution, and I'm not very optimistic about it in the book, and it it does hit on what you're saying. If reform is going to come, reform is going to come from somebody pushing back against the public employee union domination and the, the liberal Democrats in total and complete control. So it would logically come from the Republican Party, but the Republican Party brand is 
terribly broken in California. It's for a lot of reasons. It goes back to 1994 when Pete Wilson used Proposition 187 as a vehicle to get reelected uh, governor, and it, it started a narrative that uh, Republicans are mean-spirited when it comes to Hispanics. Um, Prop, Prop 187 uh, would have denied certain um, benefits, like emergency room hospital benefits, to illegal aliens. And it was seen at the time by some populists uh, as a way to protect taxpayers and to discourage immigration in the state. But it passed, but it was ruled unconstitutional. And over time, Democrats and um, public employee unions have exploited Republican support for this uh, to uh, hurt the Republican Party with Hispanic voters. And, of course, as demographics have changed and now Hispanics are the majority uh, group in the state, Hispanics comprise about, and Latinos comprise about 39% of the state, and uh, Caucasian white voters are about, or, or um, you know, whites are about 30 that used to be dominant are about 38% now. Um, voting patterns have changed. In 1984, Ronald Reagan won California for president with about 47% of the Hispanic vote, but Mitt Romney only got about 22% of the Hispanic vote when he ran for president in California. If, if Romney had gotten the Hispanic vote that Ronald Reagan did in 1984, Romney would have won the state of California. So... Uh, California's Republican brand is broken. However, what's odd about it, Jeff, is, is that there have been some studies done that show that of the nonpartisan offices where the party name isn't revealed on the ballot, right. about 50% of California elected officials are Republican. So this says that there is um, a brand problem. Um, reforming California is going to take people to wake up, whether they're Democrats, Republicans, or Independents, and to see the logical disconnect between public employee union pay and all the bad things that are happening in the state. You know, there's no rationality to the fact that California pays its teachers the highest in the nation, consistently the first, second, or third highest in the nation for teacher pay, but student performance is at the bottom, 45th, 46th, and 48th in math, science, and reading. Our kids are getting dumber they're in, because their education is poor, but we pay our teachers at the highest. That disconnect is, is because of influence of public employee unions to disconnect accountability. We need standardized testing. We need reform. And there's even moderate Democrats like Michelle Rhee and Gloria Romero, uh, who's a former head of the state Senate, uh, that have programs out there. They're Democrats. They have programs out there to reform and create accountability, which is what we need for taxpayers. But the public employee unions push back on it. The pension plans have to change. We can't afford these defined benefit plans. They need to be reformed. Public employees need to put more money in for their uh, own retirement. They need to take more responsibility for their own retirement by putting them in self-directed 401Ks. And the government has to stop simply dealing with the problem of the public employee pensions by raising taxes, <clears throat> because that's what's happening. And they're just raising taxes, and the money's going into pensions, and it doesn't go to fix roads or to provide police or to provide um, the fire services that, uh, that we really need. Governor Schwarzenegger could have reformed California, but he didn't. His reforms were a fraud. Just like Obama, as I said earlier, said, you, if you want your doctor, you can keep it. His promises to blow up the boxes didn't happen. And I know because I talked with insiders in his administration, and I have it in my book, Taxifornia, he made a deal with the California Teachers Association. And it was, look, I'll be governor, and I'll cover for you, and you let me do my thing. And what he did was he just simply gave in on, uh, on all of the pension issues. And by the end of his administration, this Republican governor had a chief of staff who was a former executive director of the California Democratic Party. Her name was Susan Davis. She had been Gray Davis as the recall governor's deputy chief of staff. So we didn't make any progress there. Um, you know, I think there's hope for California. In 1978, California was in terrible shape. The taxes were going through the roof. 
uh, uh, Jerry Brown was still the governor. Willie Brown was the speaker of the legislature. And the liberal Democrats are in control, but the people rose up because of the unfairness of these inflating property tax rates because of the in- inflation that was pushing up home values at the time. And we got Proposition 13 on the ballot, and we got it passed with a two-thirds vote in 2003. The people rose up because of a car tax and because of mismanagement by uh, Gray Davis, and he got recalled. And in that recall, we ended up getting a reform governor. It's only that the governor didn't follow up on his promises that we had the problems. In 2013, even with liberal Democrat control in Los Angeles, the liberals in, who live in Los Angeles voted down a sales tax increase because they had enough of taxes. And this year, a Republican was elected the mayor of San Diego. So I don't think that we don't have hope in this state to push back. We've been resilient, and again and again we've done it, but we're in a very dire condition. And the young people out there are the ones that are really going to be harnessed with, um, with paying taxes for government that provides them no services. And we need a clarion call. We need people to wake up. Yeah. And, uh, I hope Texafornia helps give some of that information. All right, Jim, we've got to uh, wrap it up. But you, you want to get Jim's book, as I mentioned, you can find it on Amazon. It's called Taxifornia. Uh, James Lacey, L-A-C-Y, is the author. And, James, I appreciate your time on a Saturday morning. Thanks for uh, giving us your side of it. And uh, we'll post a link to that book on our Talk Money Facebook page if you want to find it. And, and enjoy the rest of your uh, Santa Barbara Saturday. Okay, thank you very much, and, and uh, really good luck with your show. Arby. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thanks, it. Jim. There you go. He's got his. Yeah, we got to we got to take a break. We'll take a. You uh, got a quiz question there, Johnny? Yeah, real quick. So with all that, we're talking listings, home listings for sale. Which state, out of our all the great states, have the most cities with the highest listings above a million dollars? Which state in the country has the most cities on the list of uh, over million dollar listings? Three three nine eleven forty. You can text us at forty four eleven forty. This is talking money. We'll be your right ad back, Jack. That music means we got to wrap it up. I, 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 you know, it's interesting how people react to a guest like that because if you think he's just trying to sell the book, then you don't listen to the message. Whether you, you know, and if, and if you don't like what he's saying, of course, you don't listen to it either. But uh, it's almost a no-win situation. It's like if you're a politician and, and you want to go for re-election, it, if you go against the unions, you're you're it's almost suicide. I mean, for yeah. just for getting money to, to 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 run your election, so you're better off to voting whatever you want and then let the bankruptcy courts wipe out the agreements. It's you know that's what you're starting to see is it's like it, no, nobody wants to make a hard decision. So anyway, interesting book, Taxifornia. If you want to read more about that as well, uh, you might check out some of the lists of the top paying jobs, in Sacramento County. I mean, there's some huge, huge salaries Repaying. being paid, and those will be paid for life or 90 percent of them for life. So not a bad gig if you can get it. And music means we got to wrap it up. we got less than a minute here. We will be uh, live next Saturday, Sierra Tahoe, and um, we'll be giving away. i got a couple passes I'll try to carry along with me. So uh, if you're thinking about maybe trying to get in one more run for the year, you want to come up and see us, I'll grab all those passes and bring them with me. You can find us probably usually on the deck up there at uh, Sierra Tahoe from 9 to 10, and then uh, give out a few passes there if you want to come up and check us out. Uh, maybe even do some stuff during the week too. We'll figure it. Out. I got to figure out. I mean, I got left. That would help. Be helpful. That would be helpful. I didn't. You know what? I didn't cover our, re- our, rever- our reverse mortgage stuff either. So I'll do that next week. We got to go. You can find us at. Uh-